and some are seated, so I'm not going by name. I'm just going to uh, mention uh, the embassies that we have. Uh, we have the embassy uh, of the state of Eritrea, uh, embassy of uh, Republic of Sudan, embassy of Sarawi um, Republic, um, the High Commission um, of S Singapore. We have uh, with us um, the Embassy of Republic of Tunisia, the Embassy of Japan, um, Australian Embassy, um, the High Commission, uh, Embassy of South Sudan, uh, Embassy of um, the US, the US Embassy. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge our colleagues we have with us um, Professor Chris Lansbeck, who's on the way. Uh, he might join us uh, soon. Uh, coming in is Professor Adekea Debajo, the, the co-executive director for the Institute of Pan-African Thought and Conversation. We have my co-director, Professor Yin, uh, co-director of the Confucius Institute. Um, all senior UJ officials with us, ladies and gentlemen, comrades and friends. The University of Johannesburg Confucius Institute in partnership with UJ Library uh, hosts, presents this public dialogue, the role of the US and China in Africa's quest for development. The public dialogue is intended to be the first in series of dialogues on various topics in Africa-China relation. Both China and the US are important players in the politics and economic development of Africa. These two major powers have undertaken several initiatives to, to deepen their engagement with the continent to expand their interest. While the US had a head start in the investment and commercial engagement with Africa, its focus has mostly been on promoting uh, liberal democratic ideals and economic development. China, on the other hand, has enhanced its role on the continent with a no-strings-attached approach to investment and commercial engagement, creating an impression that Beijing is ready and willing to support Africa's development agenda. The public lecture will examine how China and the U.S. are engaging with Africa. It will also look at the foreign policies adopted by each country and how they fit within the broader context of Africa's development, particularly the AU Agenda 2063. Africa is a strategic, Africa is a strategic region for the US and China, and this should propel the African Union to use the opportunity to further its development agenda for the continent. It should not be Beijing or Washington. Uh, what during the Cold War we used to say, uh, neither Washington nor Moscow. Um, and without saying anything more, you have the bios of all our presenters, the panelists, in your folders. But I'll start with Professor Gilbert Kadigala. I'm going to give him 20 minutes um, to present, and then you'll be followed uh, by Professor Quinn from UCT, and then the last uh, presenter will be Professor John Stremler. Without any further ado, Professor Gilbert Kadiagala. Uh, David, thank you very much, and uh, I'm glad to be in the distinguished company of uh, eminent scholars, but also you, the audience, uh, eager to share your ideas and listen, and uh, we can have a good discussion at the end. I'm also privileged to be here a year after the launch of the Confucius Institute, uh, almost a year, and uh, I was invited to the event and uh, I benefited a lot, so I'm glad to be part of the discussions today. What David asked me to do was to set the stage for the debate around what is China and what is the United States doing in Africa. And I thought the best way to set that debate is to look at whether there is in fact something called a collective African voice around issues of, uh, 
of African development. So what I'm going to do in addressing the question of Africa's collective quest for development is to first, in fact, address the question about the obstacles to galvanizing Africa's collective voices and positions around issues of development. And the question I'm going to ask simply is, is there any African collective voice on issues around uh, development? And in fact, if there is an African voice, what is the content and what is the substance of, of those voices or those positions? Uh, I think this question will be pertinent because it will set the stage for the discussion about in the quest for Africa's development, uh, what has been the role of the US and China. The point I want to make around the African voices and African positions is very simple. That we have had so many platforms, we've, been, we've had so many policies over the last three or uh, three, uh, five to six decades of Africa's independence. But most of these platforms and policies have remained aspirational. They have remained aspirational because there has not been any conscious attempt if I had to put life into these platforms, into these policies. And that is the point that I'll be making as I look at what I'm calling the obstacles to mobilizing collective efforts around African, African, uh, African ag development agenda. I think over the years, there have been five critical issues that have animated uh, African continental efforts. The first one is security. The second one is unity. The third is prosperity. And the fourth is dignity. Number five, decolonization. So those are what I refer to as the pillars of African continental integration. Overall, however, I'm going to argue that security, unity, dignity, and decolonization have been more amenable to effective continental efforts than the issues of African prosperity. So I'm going to argue, in fact, uh, that Africa has not done as much in terms of galvanizing continental efforts, effective continental efforts at, at development. And so that's, that's the thesis. So the argument simply is Africa has done very poorly in addressing questions of development through continental institutions from the OAU into the African Union. And this is a present circumstance where we find a continental vacuum around leadership questions on development. This does not mean, however, that there have not been any efforts or any policies or any plans or declarations or declarations. In fact, I'm making the opposite argument that we've had too many declarations, we've had too many programs, we've had too many, too many platforms, but not much to show on the ground. So let me start from the, the 80s, the decisive moment where Africa is beginning to think collectively around issues of development. What did we see in the 80s? We see that alongside the Economic Commission for Africa, the OEU begins to lead a series of uh, conversations around Africa's development. These conversations culminated in the very famous Lagos Plan of Action and the final act of Lagos in 1980. This is a long-time vision 
of Africa's economic regeneration, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. So the Lagos Plan of Action set the principles and objectives and priorities for Africa's autonomous development. And I want to stress that word, Africa's autonomous development. The Lagos Plan of Action put in place what is now popularly called the Program for Africa's Collective Self-Reliance. And more importantly, the Lagos Plan of Action gave us the blueprint for the African economic community. So this is an interesting moment in, Africa, in, in continental galvanization of efforts around development. Let's get a big platform. Let's get a set of priorities that are going to inform Africa's development. So although this was a very bold and very creative effort, this was a very bold and collective attempt at continental decision-making around integration and development, the Lagos Plan of Action did not result in any measurable or any meaningful improvement on, on Africa's development. And the record is very clear. These are pronouncements that were put to African leaders at the time when Africa is very weak, at a time when Africa is getting increasingly marginalized globally. And they set up these beautiful principles around what needs to be done. But they didn't have effectively uh, any resonance on the ground. And this is what explains what has been popularly called Africa's lost decade of the 80s. The spirit of Lagos led to other similar initiatives in the mid 80s, early 90s, into the 2000s. So we have, for instance, Africa's priority program for economic recovery, mid, mid, mid 80s. We have the Abuja Treaty in 1991 that proposes the establishment of an African economic community, building on the framework of the Lagos Plan of Action. The Abuja Treaty, again, was Africa's attempt at collective vision making. Vision making around issues of economic development. The Abuja Treaty established a clear timetable for what it called full economic integration in Africa. And we got that timetable, it said 2027. Fortunately, we are not there yet. But more recently, the timetable for African economic integration was revised just this January at the AU meeting when there was a decision that in fact, Africa needs to move more decisively toward the continental free trade area. So if you follow the summit discussions, this, the continental free trade area is supposed to be established this year. So we are here and we are waiting for it. The January summit suggested that a continental free trade area would boost up intra-African trade to 25 to 30% in the next 10 years from the current 12%. That's, that's the figure for intra-African trade. But if you follow the discussions at the AU, there are very deep divisions about this uh, continental free trade area. IGAD in, uh, in, in the Horn of Africa and the East African community suggested at the summit that in fact a CFTA this year is unrealistic. It's a pipe dream. And they put up an alternative position to say Africa should concentrate on efforts towards investment in infrastructure for development rather than a new timetable for a continental free trade area, which is this year. What I'm saying here is the lack of consensus that we see at the AU in January 2017 on the continental free trade area is symptomatic of the larger problem around continental platforms 
that are pronounced, that are announced, but are actually never put to practice. And that is what I was calling initially the problem of galvanizing continental efforts around development. The closest we have come to a collective position along the lines of the Abuja and the Lagos Plan of Action is the AU's Agenda 2063, uh, unveiled about uh, three, three years ago. And Agenda 2063 is actually not different from the Lagos Plan of Action, if you look at it more critically. It is revisiting the language of collective self-reliance, Africa's prosperity, inclusive growth, people-centered development, Pan-Africanism, the African Renaissance, very beautiful words in a document. Agenda, Agenda 2063 is full of good intentions and good aspirations, but the jury understandably is still out on whether this agenda will be fulfilled, on whether the aspirations will actually be met. And I'll come back to that when I look at the Kagame report that was released in January 2017 on financing of African institutions. Because there's good language in that document that says we have to be serious if we want Agenda 23 to be the Africa's collective voice on development. But of course, before Agenda 2063, we had the promises of the new Partnership for African Development, unveiled again within a very optimistic period of Africa's regeneration, early 2000, the African Renaissance, and all these big platforms that are now saying, we lost the plot in the 70s, we lost the plot in the 80s and the 90s. Now we need to come back to an African, an Africa that is united, that is collective, that is dignified, that is responsible. Barely 13 years after the, African, the, the new partnership for African development, everybody is now asking what happened to that dream? What happened to the, the set of promises, the set of plans that were captured in, this, in, the, in that document, the NEP, the NEP, NEPA document? Again, underscoring my thesis here uh, that we failed and we are continuing to fail to have uh, clear voices on, on development because probably we can't really get a sense of what this thing development is all about. Quickly, therefore, continental visions have remained primarily that, overarching visions without substance, if I could put it that way. So let me just put three explanations quickly for why continental visions have failed and I, I, continue, I will continue to fail. And the first one is the issue of national priorities. Development is an issue that is primarily been negotiated within national contexts. And it's very difficult to ask nation states, our states, to begin to negotiate around issues of bread and butter. Although we'll see that being done sporadically within sub-regional context, and I'll come back to that. So anyway, the, the, the nation state has remained the impediment to a good continental debate on, on development. Secondly, there have been good efforts in addressing development questions through regional integration. And I've always believed that in fact, these are the key and these are the more manageable sites for addressing the bigger questions of, of development. And I've always complained that regional economic integration schemes were set up in the 60s primarily to deal with the issues of economic integration and development. In the 90s, they begin to be saddled by so many mandates, peace building, peacekeeping. So removing the original intentions of these institutions as the anchor for 
for Africa's uh, development issues. So I'm arguing therefore that we need to go back to the promise of Africa's regional integration schemes where there is better debate, where there is in fact good arguments around how we build uh, common positions around development and so on. Thirdly, Africa's collective visions on development have lacked resources. They have lacked money. And we have to keep repeating this. There cannot be any vision that is bereft of resources. Uh, so our partners, our two partners here will be telling us how to get those resources, but I'm, I'm complaining that we haven't put any money around our collective visions, and we have to keep complaining. And that's why I want to read uh, just quickly the, uh, uh, an excerpt from the Kagame report in January 2017 on financing of African institutions. And it says, the AU's programs are 97% funded by donors. By December 2016, only 25 out of 54 countries had paid their assessment for the financial year 2016 in full. 14 member states paid more than half their contributions, and 15% had not made any payment. So on the basis of that bleak picture, the Kagame report asked the question, how can member states on the African Union agenda and regain, in fact, they are using an interesting word, and regain their dignity if they do not set their own agenda? And that is the puzzle. How do you have a collective vision that you cannot, in fact, you cannot, in fact, fund? So I, I recommend everybody to read the Kagame report because it's very clear on where Africa has failed. And they're not just talking about a lack of a continental vision on economic development, but they're saying there are too many mandates. There are too many visions. And Africa is distracted. So if we are distracted by these visions, by these platforms, what are our priorities actually going to be? Uh, and it's a good question in, in looking at, therefore, the puzzle around we have never been able to have serious collective voices on issues of development. We've done well in security and so on, other things, but not development. So we should just give up. We should give up on that process of trying to galvanize a collective African voice until we resolve the puzzle of do nation states. Are they willing? Are they ready, in fact, to see the responsibilities around key issues of bread and butter to others, particularly to their neighbors? And I think that's, that's the question we need, we, need, we need to ask. And finally, we need to keep asking, if we have any collective vision, how are these vision, how is this vision going to be funded? And I think I should stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gilbert Kediagala. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to recognize uh, uh, Dr. Reika Bauer, the executive director for UJ Library, who have joined us. And we have our 13th uh, embassy uh, representative from um, uh, Russia embassy. We acknowledge um, your present. Uh, I'd like to invite my colleague, um, the co-director from University of Cape Town Confucius Institute, uh, Professor Queen Shungo. Uh, he's a co-director at, at UCT of the Confucius Institute. He's an international relation and foreign policy expert who holds a PhD in the field of political communication and intra relation in Asian Pacific region. He was a visiting scholar at the University of Winsetia in, the, in, in Madison, writing and lecturing in China's political communication. Uh, Prof, the stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, David. Thank you for inviting me to be here, to be all of you to uh, in this uh, very constructive and very meaningful dialogue. So the topic 
I want to share with you is China's role in Africa's quest for development, uh, attraction, debates, and uh, new opportunities. Uh, I think that I'm in a better position to to talk about this, po uh, this, this topic because I have been embedded into the university institution fabric for over two years. So I have been uh, providing teaching support in University of Cape Town. Uh, we have uh, helped them to construct uh, the, the Mandarin media, and we are very acti actively involved in school outreach program. And uh, we have organized a very high profile seminar, cultural activities, and also uh, the, the troop that visit China. So the first point I want to share with you is a great potential for both sides to ban wagging with each other. So we know China is um, the largest developing country in the world, and Africa is home to the largest number of developing countries. Uh, both China and Africa give top priority to development, and both, party, uh, both, uh, both sides are exploring the feasible avenues that is suited to the respective conditions, and both sides are, have been on a track of rapid development. In Africa is a continent full of hope, maintaining robust economic growth and accelerating its integration process. AU summit adopted Agenda 2063. So this plan demonstrated the dream of Africa country and the people focused on development and pursuing prosperity. China is the world's second largest economy, the largest trading nation in the world and the third largest outbound investor. And China has adopted two centenary goals. This is a new engine to boost China comprehensive development. The rise of China and Africa as two important forces will surely bandwagon with each other and have a far reach impact on international landscape. And the second point, I think that it is status quo of Sino-African development. The founding of Fokaka marks a new era of all-round development. In 2000, the trade volume between China and Africa was only 10 billion US dollars. While last year, it topped 250 billion US dollars. So during the same period, China's investment in Africa has sharply increased from 500 million dollars to 34 billion US dollars. So these two sides have made concrete progress in practical cooperation in various areas such as culture exchange, education, health, and peace and security. The third point, I think that uh, the most important of all is that intention of China's investment in Africa is benign, but not altruistic. So with China's increased economic entrenchment in Africa, so I wonder why many African nations welcome China with open arms. So one of the most important reasons is the symbolic one. China was not the one that had tried to colonize and exploit Africa. So a Nigeria ambassador in Beijing said to me that Chinese have advantage of not having a colonial handover. Whatever the Chinese do for Africa is very credible in our eyes. The so-called talks of China's intention and the practice of near colonization many from some colors of Europe and North America, and are indescribable distortion of the facts, and sometimes, to some extent, is ignorance of facts at all. So another reason for Africa's general acceptance of Chinese investment, uh, open arms to China's investment, is Chinese experience is uh, as a historical successful story of a developing nation. Because of China's, uh, China's success, especially in economic growth, rise of people's average living standard and, inter and international influence, African nations are stimulated to understand and learn those selectively according to native situation. China's success are enlisting China's help in areas and by ways decided by African nations themselves. One Western scholar write that the idea of China was a model for prosperity had captured the imagination of many of ordinary Africans. The third reason for African acceptance to Chinese investment 
has been the general lack of conditions attached to China's aid. The roughly only political condition China requires is acceptance of one China po policy. This is a minimum friendly posture of a national government toward China. Conversely, Western powers attach long list of requirements that the African government need to achieve as a condition to loan and aid. So many of the requirements such as tackling corruption, uh, transparency, democratic reforms are perhaps noble and constructive in their intentions. But in some cases, they are effective. But they are not often easily achieved or even opposite to African autonomy or concrete situations which result in direct punishment and the damage to the recipient nations and the peoples. So the first point I want to share with you is some misconception. So many of the Western response to China's involvement in Africa have been fierce, and a lot of them are misleading. One common criticism against those involvement is that they are only interested in African oil, minerals, and natural resources. Of course, China needs sources of valuable, valuable natural resources because China continues to grow and increase and depend on the overseas supply. This is not the only reason for the Chinese aid and investment in Africa. So this sort of statement is some sort of misinformation in that it does not look at the overall picture. So China has indeed great interest in Africa resources, but suggesting that this is the only reason it is offered that China is involved in Africa is a force. China has been doing a lot of grassroots work to modernize the infrastructure of Africa, eliminate poverty, and promote education exchange. So one frustrating part of Western criticism of China is that most criticism seems to be a little bit hypocritical. Much of the reason that a large part of Africa has been in such bad shape for many years is that Western nations has used Africa often for their own purposes. For example, shortly after World War II, the uh, United States signaled anti-colonial tomb in Africa, what would have been a global policy, so ended once a Cold War began, uh, began in the 1950s. So Washington instead began to talk about the containment and anti-communism, and no anti longer pursue a European ally to surrender the African positions. So throughout the Cold War, the United Nations and the, and the former U.S. turned Africa into a strategic playground to conduct their own ideological games, resulting in the deaths of millions of Africans. Okay, so the, the fifth point, the new opportunities. So in uh, uh, two, uh, 2015 Fukaka Ministerial Conference, so both parties agreed to build three network and accelerating industrialization. Namely, the network of railway, highway, and the regional aviation in Africa, and the six major areas as a priority for the cooperation. Namely, the industrialization, financial cooperation, poverty alleviation, ecological and environmental protection, cultural exchange, peace, and security. No conclusion. The China's emerging role in China has been a source of debate and it will continue to spark lively discussion and argument. But it is important to understand the actual situation. So as a former Nigeria uh, finance uh, minister said, that China should be left alone to forge its unique partnership with African countries and that the West must simply learn to compete. Competition, in this sense, can only yield a positive result for Africa because Africans will be able to choose whatever path will benefit them the most. So for this to happen, China's policy in Africa need to continue to evolve and get even better. So Chinese sh need to take better care of the Chinese immigration immigrants in, a in Africa while also make sure that the Chinese management adapt to the local context. Dumping of goods should be mitigated. Balanced development and the environmental protection must be attached more importance and practical efforts. Cultural gap in various forms must be shortened by various concrete and effective measures. 
So I think the CI, Confucius Institute in African continent, has did has done a good job in eliminates the misinformation and also the misunderstanding between African people and China. And the CIOJ is now becoming a flagship in African continent. So this is much due to the work of the local director, my friend David. So moreover, China also have to modify selectively its undifferentiated non-interference policy because some of the badly governing dictators and the corrupt institutions in Africa really cannot be tolerated. Human rights consideration as well as the good governance should be put higher in priority of policies in guiding China's economic involvement in Africa. If China makes lesser adjustment suggested here and above, then it could reap the massive benefits that come with Africa's emergence in a world stage. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, colleague. Uh, the next last speaker um, is difficult for me to introduce him because he's my former supervisor. As a matter of fact, I, I, I need to declare and uh, Professor Gilbert Gadiagala is also my former supervisor. I acknowledge uh, Professor Garth um, uh, from VETS University, International Relation. Uh, professor John Stremler is a visiting professor at VETS University. He served from 2006 to 2015 as Vice President for Peace at Carter Center from 1998 to 2006, the years that I, I, I got to know him. As my supervisor, he was um, young, smart, and head of international relations department at Vets University. Uh, he's currently um, a visiting professor and uh, supervising quite a, a lot of students. Um, John, the stage is yours. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Manya is being a too modest. Uh, Truth, truth be known, uh, I've been taking his advice for a long time, including the first moment we met down in Solomon Schlongo Freedom Hall, but it wasn't called that then, uh, after my interview at, uh, in 1998, and he said, I think you should take this job. And I said, I think it'd be very difficult. He said, I think you should take it. I think it was more a comment on the opposition that I was running against. But in any case, when he called on this, on this particular event, I said, well, it's a very important and interesting topic. I'm not sure I can add any value. And it's even more difficult to be the third speaker in this, in this series because Professor Kaliagala, my distinguished, in far, far more distinguished successor, who didn't get quite the fulsome introduction that he deserves, but that's, <laughs> that's a something that everyone knows Gilbert. So, um, my 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 willingness to be here was was premised on the fact that I might uh, take a little license after hearing what my other colleagues had said, and to try to do it within the time frame which they both honored very carefully. Um, my my task is is nominally to talk about the U.S. role, and uh, Dr. Quinn um, uh, talked a lot about the economic side of things. I am going to talk less about the economic side of things. Uh, although I do have some numbers if pushed under questions. But I wanted to talk instead on three areas broadly. One is uh, U.S.-China bilateral relations. Uh, the second is the U.S.-Africa relationship, recognizing as Gilbert so eloquently reminded us of the complexity of this continent. So I'd rather say sub-Saharan Africa, and that's still 39 sovereign states. But my most important uh, topic from my own standpoint, and I hope from yours, is the possibility of win-win-win among China, Africa, and the United States. That's a very complex and difficult subject, but I think it lends itself extremely well to research projects and advocacy and exploration by public intellectuals, by students, and by scholars at universities, because we have the freedom to probe a little more deeply into the underlying currents that are likely to shape this, these complex relationships going forward into the 21st century. Um, 
suffice it to say that with regard to the United States, uh, it's not the Eurocentric enlightened self-interest of the 1940s that are prevailing. And I really do need to begin my remarks with a brief uh, touch with U.S. reality affecting all three of the topics that I'm going to cover. And I'll do it very briefly. But the elephant or perhaps the raging bull in America's living room is Donald J. Trump. I always uh, thought it was the, 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 the lion without courage but of Alice in Wonderland. But I, I, I realize this is a serious moment and a crisis moment in U.S. political history, and it does have knock-on effects internationally. He's the least popular and least prepared president in modern American, perhaps ever, in American history. And the first month of his administration has, to say the least, been very messy with the um, would-be State of the Union first speech to the Congress, joint session of Congress Tuesday night. There was no foreign policy aspects to that speech that I could hear, and I've read it fairly carefully. There is the $54 billion more for defense to uh, uh, chase unknown enemies and hypothetical contingencies. I'm not quite sure what that would go for, but I know there's a lot of sentiment that that should be increased. The, the, the article, if you have time to take a look at, recently in Politico by John Finer, and I should add that John Finer was head of policy planning in the Obama administration. Um, that, that argues very compellingly that, that Trump really doesn't have a foreign policy right now other than America first. We're not quite sure what that means. But we do know that from his background, and I've written a little bit about this, that it, it is transactional. Um, it is zero-sum thinking which predominates, which is contrary to where I'm going in this talk briefly. Um, the, the, the comment that was, that was thought to be most telling by something that I wrote and Gilbert wrote on Trump and Africa was that, is the U.S. losing out to China? Uh, that was a four-page list of questions that circulated in the State Department and the Defense Department, supposedly from the Trump transition team. And it was the first clues we had. This was before the calls to Buhari and to Jacob Zuma. The first clues we had of any interest at all in Africa, and the State Department seems to be marginalized at the moment, uh, as you all know from reading the press and, and Rex Tillerson's problems. Uh, but, but the problem I had with my four-page quote was it came from the New York Times, Helene Cooper, who has family I know, and I've respected her as a journalist for a long time. The embassy calls me after I published Trump versus, uh, versus Africa and said, well, listen, you know, you're doing with face fake news here, that, that that list was really prepared internally for the State Department to prepare people to give testimony on the Hill. It didn't come from the Trump transition team. How do I know? How do I know? How do scholars know? How any of us know what we're dealing with in this in this in this world of, of 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 multiple avenues of information? That I thought was authoritative. I didn't, contrary to some colleagues urging me to do a retraction, say no, no. I think it reflects the sentiment, but that's a value judgment on mine, so I didn't do anything about it. In any case, what we don't can't afford to ignore, and for your generation, to the students here, is that the three great M's that, that uh, Tom Friedman's been writing about in, in Thank You for Being Late, the new bestseller on the future challenges of the world, Moore's Law, technology, market globalization, and Mother Nature, climate change. All states today find it harder to govern with power being increasingly diffuse, and they don't reflect the conventional state as actor model that I know Gilbert was struggling with a bit in terms of thinking about how it relates to development versus security and other things I'll struggle with. But <laughs> we, we, we have too many avenues of relationships, which is why I want to talk briefly about the U.S.-China relationship, which is far more complex than a textbook would lead you to believe. Uh, and I want to talk about the Africa relationship, too, very briefly before I go to win-win-win. Um, to, to cut to the chase on the U.S.-China relationship, John Pomfret, the longtime correspondent for the Washington Post, has just published a, a wonderful book on the relationship between China and the United States going back into, to, to, to 1776 and the founding of the Declaration of Independence, the founding of the American Republic. It's called The Beautiful Country and the Middle Kingdom. Now, China is a civilization 5,000 years old, and the U.S. is an upstart country of 230 years old. They have been deeply entangled throughout the entire existence of the United States in different and complex up and down ways. But I think the only time they've gone to war was in the Korean Peninsula in the 1950s, which I remember very well. Um, I'm sad to say I'm that old. Um, my first sort of exposure to international affairs. Uh, the the U.S.-China uh, 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 relationship is one-two. 
in terms of military spending and in terms of economies. We all know that. The really interesting question for the generation coming through UJ right now, though, is when China supplants the United States as the leading power, it's likely that that would happen, well, how will that happen? Will it be as peaceful as was, it was with the UK, which shared li linguistic and, and, and historic and cultural affinities, Second World War, Eurocentric construction of the UN and the, and the, and the Bretton Woods institutions and even the, uh, the Declaration of Human Rights <coughs> to prevent a, a Third World War in Europe? Never mind Africa, never mind, uh, well, poor China was left off, not can't say poor, but uh, Taiwan with all this craziness of the, of the uh, uh, Kuomintang and, 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 and that faction on the island. Um, it, it's, it's hard to know how this relationship is going to proceed, except I'm really attracted to, and this will be sort of my last point on this, the re reciprocity approach that Obama took as evidence in his efforts to try to get something settled in the South China Sea, the, 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 the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which didn't have China initially but could have brought them in, the kind of cooperation on cy uh, cybersecurity, which is something the Carter Center worried about because we were penetrated by Chinese uh, 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 companies trying to read our email, and, and every time the Dalai Lama came to Emory University, and I raised this with the with the Chinese Consul General, she said, well, you know, we have to spam your email because this is an offense to us. This is the one China policy. This is the one China policy. Now, how, how Xi Jinping, a serious leader, makes sense of Donald Trump on the one hand, taking a call from the president of Taiwan, on the other hand, reaffirming one China policy, God only knows. But I think the possibility of having a business-like recipro re reciprocal relationship with China is very promising. And in this current issue of Foreign Affairs Magazine, which I think you can get online, Susan Shirk, who I've admired for a long time for her Sinology and her service in government, has written Trump and China getting to yes with Beijing. But basically, she's rehashing the Obama policy. She's a Democrat and she's rehashing it. But it's, it makes sense to me. Um, I can't see any concessions from the Chinese in advance of the 19th Party Congress this year. It's just too sensitive on South China Sea issues or Taiwan. Um, the irony is Xi and, and, and Trump seem to be both uh, ethnic nationalists in a way, strong men, although uh, uh, President Xi is a lot more skillful and talented a leader. Um, but he's sitting on a regime which is uh, younger than I am. Uh, the, the People's Republic of China was only founded in 1949. It may be a 5,000 year civilization, a, a Han civilization, but it's only since 1949. And what's going to happen in 2049, when the 100th anniversary comes, is the party strong enough? Is the regime strong enough? Does it mean anything to say it's a communist regime? These are really interesting questions. Where will America be in 2050? Well, if you look at the Democratic Party, they just had a standoff on their um, two, two, two heads, and it was Tom Perez, a Hispanic, versus Keith Ellison, a, a, an African American. By 2050, the United States will become a majority minority country not no longer a white nationalist that Steve Bannon and Trump seem to be celebrating so much in the last gasp. So what could this relationship contribute to U.S.-Africa and the win-win-win? The U.S.-Africa relationship also goes back even earlier than the Chinese one to the 16th century. The 450,000 slaves brought from this continent now have mushroomed into 42 million African Americans, a very important and powerful force in the United States. Michelle Obama, exemplary of that. Um, there are 2.1 million immigrants from Africa in the last 10 years coming into the United States. That's five times the number who came in the Middle Passage. Um, Africa is culturally and religiously interdependent to a far greater extent um, with the U.S. Uh, uh, than is the U.S. and China, or for that matter, China and Africa. Last time I read a figure, and don't trust these numbers, but I think there was only 1,450 nationalized Chinese out of 1.3 billion predominantly Han Chinese. So as an ethnic state, it's really an interesting problematic for the country, and I mean for the world, it's seven and a half billion, much more diverse. Um, uh, Africa's economic ties to the United States are relatively small, $33 billion in trade for an economy that, that's two-way trade between, uh, it's a surplus for Africa, but nevertheless a two-way trade. But the U.S. economy is 17 trillion. I, these numbers don't mean much to me and I don't think to you, but it's just proportional to give you some idea. 
I think Africa will not be a major concern of Trump unless, God forbid, there's another Dar es Salaam bombing or Nairobi-type bombing or a, a 103 Pan Am shoot down or something, and we can only guess what he might do. Um, bipartisanship predominates in Africa policy generally in the United States, which is good, so long as it's fairly low key, and I think it's reflective of a general appreciation of the history for which the country has never reconciled and never had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So let me just sort of conclude on the win-win-win or complex positive sums involving more than governments. And here you have the advantage tomorrow online of a foreign policy article that is yet, I've seen the draft, it's untitled. It's composed by uh, three distinguished individuals. Mohammed Ibn Shamads, who is the special representative of the UN Security, uh, uh, Security Gen uh, Secretary General, and head of the UN Office for West Africa, Sahel. The other is Ambassador Zhang Jinho, former Chinese Special Representative on African Affairs, someone I've had a number of dealings with and been extremely impressed, and he's a former ambassador to South Africa. Ambassador Princeton Lyman, Special Envoy, Sudan, South Sudan, and also Ambassador to South Africa, as well as Nigeria, and a former Assistant Secretary of State. This is a project that was undertaken by the Carter Center to try to think through what might be a win-win-win proposition, which needs an awful lot of research and a lot of thought. In Africa, it should be clear to both the United States and China that their shared priorities dwarf their differences, contrary to the, the, the competition that was suggested in the Trump memo or that Dr. Quinn was referring to. Um, their shared priorities dwarf their differences and should uh, they should cooperate where they can for mutual gain, as Obama declared in his 2011 announcement to pivot to Asia. In Africa, U.S. and China broadly agree on importance of supporting the following, economic growth and development, combating disease, mitigating conflict, enhancing political stability, fighting violent extremism, and organized crime. Broadly shared by African governments and international organizations, Coordination among China, U.S., and Africa is not quixotic. It can't be too ambitious, however. Let me give you quickly, how's my time coming, by the way, David? All right. Um, I was supposed to set my, my wonderful iPhone here. This is the technology, the Moore's Law thing, but I forgot to do it. Anyway, let me give you some quick examples to show you the kind of win-win-win that have, have been attempted, even though the situation may not have turned out all that well yet, and that is for first one, China, U.S., African Union, EGAD, working on the peace processes in Sudan, South Sudan. I was really impressed with how much Ambassador Zhang and Ambassador Lyman were able to quietly work together to make sure that they were trying to push for the same thing that we all want for that godforsaken country of uh, Sudan, South Sudan, or the two countries now. Um, since 2010, another, another item, China's coordinated uh, a success in the successful anti-piracy operation in the Horn of Africa, which had been a real concern and a relative success, I think, which is promising for the Horn of Africa. Beijing and Washington worked well together in tackling the Ebola crisis in West Africa, let us not forget. That could be a precedent for the future. We need more efforts for cooperation on maritime security in the Gulf of Guinea, <clears throat> addressing consequences and causes of violent extremism in Sahel and Sahara. That's tough. Tough stuff, but the UN spends 80% of its annual peacekeeping budget on Africa. US and China are top two financial backers of the UN Security Council's peace operations, 28% and 10% of the UN PKO budget, respectively. Beijing has 2,600 UN peacekeepers now in Mali, South Sudan, Ivory Coast, and elsewhere. And Xi Jinping is, pr is pledging 8,000 more as standby forces, which is very important. The U.S. has only 68 troops, but offers strategic lift capacities and other means and intelligence sharing and other advantages to this. And I think um, someone other than perhaps Trump right now might be amenable to expanding that. U.S., um, uh, that is to say Obama, announced $110 million for a peacekeeping rocket rapid response partnerships, but that was with particular countries, Ethiopia, Ghana, Rwanda, Senegal, Tanzania, and Uganda. It's a five-year program of capacity building in standby peacekeeping forces for those countries. China, at the same time, has pledged $100 million to the African Union standby peacekeeping force. These overlaps are clear. They need some thought. They need some research. They need some advertisement of win-win-win. 
the U.S. needs to share more information to avoid, and, and China, need to share more information so that they don't duplicate each other. I know they bump into each other, and you've got the two naval bases now in Djibouti. Maybe that's a target, actually, of opportunity. But in any case, um, it's not going to be easy. Um, coordination on the ground for African efforts in the Peace Corps, and especially in the UN and the African Union, the re regional re economic organizations that Gilbert mentioned, um, so far, these conversations have been all too rare, but I share, as Gilbert mentioned, the Kagame report is easily available, and we all should be reading it because it really does focus on the need for imperative for strengthening the African Union, and that should be a conversation that's also held with the Chinese and the Americans. Um, the China and the U.S. should back the AU as it works to end Africa's wars by 2020. That's a security concern, not a development concern, as this conference is, 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 is addressing. The ex extensive um, discussions of possible cooperation in anti-piracy off the Horn of Africa continue, should continue, and with ECOWAS and the other regional organiza sub-regional organizations. Tackling terror together is a complex subject I won't go into, but so long as the win-win um, uh, mentality prevails, it's African-led, and collaboration between China and the U.S. and the African actors can help everyone transform occasional moments of cooperation into habits of cooperation. That's my pitch. Um, there's been an entente between Beijing and, 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 and uh, Washington for the last 40 years. That's at risk. If Africa could play some role in reinforcing that through practical means, that would be great. Finally, and last point, I have personally seen the fruits of cooperation in the dozen or more election missions that I have led in Africa uh, during my time at the Carter Center. This was in the Mono River region countries. It was uh, in, interesting to me to see Ch uh, China part of the Friends Group. I was glad that, that Dr. Uh, Quinn mentioned uh, China's attention and sensitivity to the kinds of concerns the African Union's Constitutive Act has with regard to dictatorships and abuse of power and non-constitutional governance. But I was really thrilled to see the Chinese flag on one of the voting, on, on, the, on the ballot boxes that were used in the Guinea election. And I've used that in lectures in China on China-Africa. In Liberia, the ambassador, ambassador and, and the Chinese ambassador had their staff get together and have lunch once, or, or suppers once a month with different cuisines. Uh, the consultations that are going on practically among missions at the, at the level, uh, sort of out of sight of Beijing and Washington, are very, very important. They deserve a little more uh, uh, reflection. They deserve some research, and I think you could probably get the cooperation of Chinese ambassadors. I mean, I talk to Chinese ambassadors in African countries, as long as I don't have to report back to Beijing. You know, these countries are complicated, and there's lots of different interests involved. And the Amer American ambassador says the same thing, but an American ambassador in, in a leading um, uh, African country said to me once, you know, my counterpart here, and it was not South Africa, by the way, my counterpart here uh, the, from the China embassy, he spent 20 years working on Africa. He's now a real Africanist. When, 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 when the countries became independent, there were not real Chinese Africanists, and they're real American Africanists. And their interests are for the betterment of Africa, for the betterment and line self-interest of the two parent countries, the, the, his, his country and, and the Chinese country. So talk with ambassadors, get around, get the Confucian Institute to send you on travel uh, trips, get trips to China to talk about and to Washington. I don't know if the American embassy here is willing to sponsor those kind of agenda items, but. This is a research topic where field research is expensive. Chris and Adi and David may be able to help. Lots of local interest in solving problems together. Those should be amplified um, and, and then maybe take them to DC and Beijing and see what people up the ladder think. Think global and act, act local was, was an old cliche of the 70s. Now it really matters and I wish you well in your pursuits. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, John. Um, before we lose some of our students, uh, vibrant uh, student, uh, they are in and out classes, and we highly value their, their presence. I'd like to make uh, an announcement that next week, Thursday, we're going to have one of the best African diplomat, scholar, a Nigerian um, professor, Ibrahim Gambari, um, he will address us uh, around nine o'clock. You'll get your invitation. Um, I think 
He played a critical role during the anti-apartheid struggle and the role played by Nigeria and Africa as a whole. And I say this in the context of what's happening uh, in our country. Um, um, the xenophobic uh, attacks. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward, even though his focus is going to be on peace and security issues, but we're looking forward to have him uh, since he directly uh, played um, a role in the, in the fight against apartheid. So invitations will be coming. Nine March, next week, Thursday, nine March, um, three o'clock, I think uh, you'll get uh, invitations as of tomorrow. Um, thanks, thanks, Professor Adike Adbajo. Let me uh, read, um, as I said, my PhD supervisor, Professor uh, Gilbert Gadiagala's uh, bio, which I did not do. Uh, Professor Gilbert Gadiagala is Jan Smart Professor of International Relation and the head of Department in International um, Relation at Bates University. He's a Kenyan, um, um, spent great time of his uh, life in the US. Um, uh, he lectured at John Hopkins, and um, he has been at Bates since 2007, if I'm not mistaken. And um, uh, is a great scholar, Africanist, and uh, my apology for not reading the bio. I'd like to open the discussion. Uh, Time-wise, as you can hear outside, uh, some of us, I'm, I'm, I'm quasi-atheist, but I believe, as my name is David, uh, i like to thank the Lord. Our dams are getting full, uh, and it's one of the major security issues uh, that we at times take for granted. So uh, it's a pleasure to hear the noise outside. Uh, I would like to open the, uh, we should be finishing at quarter past, quarter past half past west of west, half past four, uh, but I would like to open for questions, um, inputs. Please make it brief so that we can allow as many people as possible to contribute. Um, identify yourself, the institute, uh, institution that you represent, and go straight to the point. Um, I now open uh, for discussion to all our presenters. Yes, sir, we have a roving uh, mic. Uh, yes, sir, right here. Noted. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Frank Asimbo. I'm the chairperson of the Congolese diaspora for Nelson Mandela Legacy. Yeah. You, you know what makes America and China to be a, the bigger nations in the world? It is not about their size, about their army or universities, but it is about their common vision for the country. And if I get you correctly, the, the, the first presenter, my professor here, he was saying that uh, the lack of uh, a global vision for Africa, for development, is, is a big problem, a big challenge. Even the regional integration. Uh, and uh, he, he, he mentioned that the national priorities make it very difficult to achieve that, that objective. And this is exactly what is happening in Africa. We can't talk about uh, the, that, that uh, common vision while in Africa we've got wars, we've got ethnicities, war between the people. And here you were talking about uh, the, the Kagame report. You know, if I, if I respect uh, the, the Excellency, his Excellency uh, Kagame, because of that leadership, yeah, leadership vision, please, we've got problem. All the organizations around the world is, is, is proof that they don't have respect for Africa. They war everywhere in the in the Africa, all over the Africa, but nobody 
even the, the United States can come forward to finish the, those, those wars. Instead, they are promoting wars among pe African people, which is very, very dangerous. Let, let me talk, but because this, this is very important. My, my brother, thank you very much for your contribution. We understand your point. You made a good point. Thank you. Yes. We, I have noted, um, yeah, right here. Okay. Let's start right here. Okay. Yes. Then I'm coming to you, right? Yes. Okay. Hello. My name is Tara Mock. I'm a visiting scholar from Michigan State University in the United States. So first, just a brief point of clarification. You quoted the number of um, enslaved Africans who were transported via the transatlantic slave route is 450,000 to the U.S. Okay, okay, that was disturbing. So thank you for clarifying that. Um, and secondly, my question to you, sir, is regarding your um, statements regarding China's interest in not only Africa's resources, but you mentioned several times that it goes beyond that. So I think that many of us are aware of China's interest in the resources, and that's most clear when we look at the export numbers from the continent to China. Can you speak a bit more regarding um, how China's interest outside of the natural resources manifests itself um, beyond those numbers? Thank you, Madam. May I have you, sir? Hi, afternoon. My name is Ubenati. I'm a student at UJ. Uh, according to Meredith, by 2010, he says trade between Africa and China had risen to nearly $115 billion in a space of a decade. Then according to the AU report in 2002, it estimated that corruption cost Africa $148 billion annually. Now to me that suggests that corruption always trumps development. Will we ever have mechanisms in place to make sure that development one day will trump corruption? Thank you. May I have you right there, sir? Uh, San Bonan. Yeah. Uh, bing satanda ukulmanga loku. Uguze bing 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 kala sense kanje. Angi angi skulu misingis. Kwenzwa idoko. Mubangi azuko kwa na bagini na endo fumu kaza loku. We can't speak English. Um, okay. All right. Let me do this for you, sir. Also, thank you. I do not want to speak English. The point is this. First and foremost, the land we are in right now, it's a land whereby it's not conducive for the person speaking in the same land for him. But I'm going to just come to the topic just quickly. What are the interests of China? Why did China go to the nearest people there are? Why did they go to India? Why did they go to the Koreans? But why is Africa allowing all of these things happening in the same land again? Is the same, is the same script, different cast, coming us together? Or are we in the same thing again, all over again, that we don't want to close our borders for the outside people? And do we think that us having our own thing as Africans, it's, it's not a good. China had their wars. That's why they are combined today. America is owing China trillions. Nobody's speaking about that. And now America cannot not pay China in the upcoming millennia whatsoever can think about. But now they're coming to Africa because America has liars with China to come to Africa. Are we thinking about these things? Is there any interest of us in the place or is there interest of their own in their mind? Because I think as Africans, it's about time we close the doors and we speak to what belongs to us. People may argue we don't have resources. Guess what? Cobalt in the DRC from my brother there who was closed. He's fighting that. But now the same mic is going to be taken away from you because you started speaking the truth. Right? Cobalt. Whatever minerals of the cell phones we're having, they're mined from Africa. They don't find anywhere else. But now the same thing we're going to be arguing here and saying that, no, this is a good, it's not a good relationship for us. Thank you, my brother. I... Can we have any other, before I hand over to our panelists, any other right here? Can I? Uh, thanks, and that's a good presentation from all of you. Uh, my name is Enoch Pepper. Uh, 
My question centers more about what the previous person asked. Is it a replay of the Cold War in a different uh, format? Perhaps I will call it a hot, a hot war, not a Cold War. But my serious concern is leadership. I, I recognize that very little was said about leadership. When we look back in the 60s, Korea, Singapore, uh, those countries seem to have had semi-detectors. Some would be more kind and say benevolent detectors. They drove the development agenda in their countries. And in some sense, when you go back to Ghana and Kruma those days, they seem to be you know, driving that kind of agenda. To what extent does the leadership in Africa play into this game? Because as far as I'm concerned, it looks like a replay of the Cold War then. You know. Thank you. May I have you, madam? Good afternoon, and thank you so much for your presentation to the speakers. Uh, my name is Ntope Mapefani, and I'm from the University of Pretoria Center for Human Rights. Um, I am not um, too well informed regarding the actual um, developments that China's um, undertaking and the US, specifically in Africa, you know, so I would know what's happening in South Africa. My concern is, you know, certain African countries have committed to human rights treaties and agreements and obligations. Um, when you look at China, it's different. And there's a, it is going to clash with our obligations as Africa if we coming into agreement with countries such as China or the US that are not um, committed to upholding human rights obligations. And what does that mean for us as Africa? Um, I do believe that we need to take stock of what's important for us um, instead of letting, you know, countries such as China or the U.S. coming in and telling us this is a great deal, that there will be ramifications later, and these are human rights implications as well. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, perhaps I should, uh, may I have you, Ambassador? Thank you. Thank you. My name is Salah, Ambassador of the State of Eritrea. Well, let me first apologize for coming late. Uh, my question is, uh, is could, you, could one say that there is a sound reason to assume that there will be a stepwise normalization of the United States foreign policy towards Africa outlined by the current President Tam, uh, Trump for his uh, or his closest uh, advisors. My second question is, since I came late, maybe it has already been on the floor, but uh, would you please explain the nature of the political change under the President, under, uh, the President Trump uh, presidency? I thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, perhaps I'll turn to our panelists. There's so many um, inputs. So it's an open-ended, you um, take a bit of the chunk of the big elephant. Uh, let's, yeah, we'll start with you. Um, so I'm going to say a few words about your question. And uh, since the 1950s, um, uh, African Union is the all-weather friend of China. Since, since the, and uh, besides the natural resources, and China invests heavily in African continent. So we help build the high-speed train in Ethiopia. So in Ethiopia, we have the first high-speed bullet train in African continent. So we help build the, the, the port in Zambia and Tanzania. And we help renovate the railway between Tanzania and Zambia. And um, China medical aid is, has been in African continent for over 30 years. So we fight with the, all kinds of infectious disease in some uh, the, the, the allergic areas. And I think that strategically, um, the Chinese interest in African continent is minimal. So what Chinese seek most is the making money with, Chinese, with, with African countries. You know, 
so Xi Jinping initiated the One Belt, One Road strategy. So some African countries are uh, uh, incorporated in this grand strategy. So through this One Belt, One Road, I think that uh, some African countries will benefit from this grand Chinese strategy because China has entered a new phase of modernization and industrialization. We have a very large amount of output supplies. So through this trans uh, transition of output supplies to these African countries, we can help modernize the infrastructure of some African countries, such as Ethiopia, Zambia, Tanzania, and Egypt, and uh, Abalia, so that kind of thing. Anyone? John? Well, only, is it on? Only, it's on? Yeah. yeah. Now, only to say to the Ambassador of Mir Chi, I, I don't want to repeat what I did say early on, which is I'm in a dilemma here because there's no foreign policy on the part of Trump. The implications for African countries is if he's going to be a transactional zero sum, get your best bargain you can on the issues that you, you're engaging on and pray it's not a terrorist event that, that he could do something crazy on. I just don't know yet. It's too early. And there's no advisors that have been identified that to be um, to be appointed, uh, and, and we're all reading the same paper, papers. The bigger question, though, that I tried to address is whether or not this is a chance for confidence building between China and the U.S., and that may raise some concerns here in Africa uh, about a condominium um, or some sort of neocolonialism. But I think that the pragmatists, such as Ambassador Zhang and Princeton Lyman, and more importantly, the African participant in that, the, the, it's a three-cornered game which everyone accepts ought to be deferred to. The Africans need to have an agenda. They need to have an agenda like Gilbert was talking about to sort of drive the process of engaging China and the U.S. in a win-win. Now, Gambari's coming here next week. Ask him what he thought of the APRM. You know, Thursday is APRM day. And so, therefore, uh, he's here for that. And Eddie Maloka is revitalizing it. And, you know, maybe this consultation ought to go on within that forum as well. How do you engage countries which don't have strategic interests but have big political interests, different ones, mind you, than China and, 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 and U.S. have different political interests here. But it's a target of opportunity. And I think Africa ought to take the values that Gilbert was outlining, including dignity, and push for this and maybe link it to development eventually, but it's probably going to be more productive in the short term on security issues, which at the FOPAC, everyone said, the FOPAC said the African leaders conveyed the concern that they had for security issues, and China's responding. So that's good. Gilbert? Uh, the, my, my colleague from the Congo uh, is raising a critical issue that, uh, my, my point was that the visions have been there, uh, guided by the overarching vision of Pan-Africanism. Uh, the only problem has been how do we actually translate some of the smaller visions around Pan-Africanism into something much more concrete. Uh, and so that's the dilemma. Uh, and it's a question of leadership too. Uh, we have had uh, uh, very consistent African leadership uh, when we had Nkrumahs of this world, when we had Mbekis of this world, but then after a while, then we get distracted. Uh, but I also don't even think the problem is leadership. I think we should be saying, uh, what happened to the African Renaissance? Uh, this, is a, this, is a, this is an idea that is very African, and is an idea that should not go under. It's an, a, not an idea that should disappear, because it's the overarching idea that we've had over the years, and it should be framing our, our, our interaction every other day. But we have uh, a leadership fixation, which, which is dangerous. We're waiting for the big man to, to provide the vision. And that's how we get distracted. That's, that's the crisis around the AU that the Kagame report is talking about. The, 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 the vision of Pan-Africanism has not really been captured very clearly within the institutional framework that we call the African, African Union or other institutions. So it is a lack of translation of our visions into more solid institutional structures and running away with these, uh, with these visions. So we have a lot of declarations that come every other year, and we like them a lot. And then we go back and we say, no, you know, we can just uh, get another declaration after we fail to implement the, the previous one. So that, that's, the, that's the dilemma. And the Kagame report is actually not the first report 
to talk about the lack of uh, institutional leadership. The Adedeji, Adedeji report was already there on the audit of the, of the AU much earlier, complaining about the same things, uh, complaining about the same figure, 97% uh, funded by donors. Uh, and then uh, it says, you know, where is the African agenda here? On the issue, I think, on uh, the colonial, neocolonialism, I mean, there is a narrative that China and, and, uh, and, and the U.S. Are, are competing in Africa. I like the notion that you brought up, John, on, on the question of how do we actually think more creatively about win-win? Uh, because we don't really want to go back to the broken paradigm of the past, which says that Africa should be playing one power against the other. That's really old, old mentality. That's old thinking. Uh, and I hear that every day, that, you know, we need China and Africa because then it can counterbalance the West. And it's a stupid argument. I think we should be saying, what is African agency in this whole, whole process? How does Africa then organize itself to deal with these actors, rather than being defensive, being reactive. And so the question around whether it's a neocolonial game or not, it's for Africa, actually, Africans to begin to say, what is it that we want from the Chinese? Uh, what is it that we want from the Americans? So I, I get tired when I hear the FOCAC meeting, the Chinese saying, you know, where, where is the African position? And that should not be a question the Chinese should be asking Africans. <laughs> Africa should be organized before they meet the Chinese, rather than the other way around. So it has to be a problem of how you restructure the notion of African responsibility, African ownership around these issues. And there should be honest debate about where we are failing, because we always want to be like diplomats, we don't want to say the truth. So the, the, the plea, therefore, is that... <laughs> The plea is that we should be saying more of these things. Uh, my friend uh, Enoch is talking about uh, the issue around economic leadership uh, of the East Asian model. Again, if you read some of our, glo our African documents, they are promising us that. They are saying, you know, we want to be like, like Asia. Uh, and Mr. Kagame does that domestically. He says, oh, we want to transform our country into a modern country. How can that vision be put at the continental level? And my point is probably we shouldn't even be bothering uh, because uh, as long as we exhaust the entire uh, issues around leadership at the domestic level, we are not going to get leadership at the regional level. If there are deficits in leadership at home, how do we expect that we are going to have good leadership in, in these African institutions? And I've used that argument to say, uh, if you have countries that are abusing constitutions at home, how do you expect them to go and respect continental or regional institutions? So it's a bigger crisis around uh, where is the vision, uh, where, where is the leadership, and so on. Thank, thank you, Gilbert. Can I, any, any other? Yes. I'll take a few and then allow my co-director to... Uh, can, can you have a mic, please? Okay, not it. Hi, my name is uh, it's uh, Papi Otab from the NGO. Uh, yeah, from the NGO Nelson Mandela Legacy. Yeah, my question is going to uh, the professor when he talk about uh, the 25 percent that the UN peacekeeper is uh, putting on the amongst some country in uh, Africa like Uganda, Rwanda and all those countries that you you say but for me I wanted to emphasize something it's like uh, when we see Africa Africa it's among the richest continent in the world. But African people, they are, they are suffering too much. There is lack of education, lack of economic basic. So everything is very, very down. But when we see the politics about uh, from the States and uh, China, what are they investing in Africa? 
to rebuild Africa, to make Africa to be strong. But we see in other countries, for example, in DRC Congo, there is no democracy. So there is lack of democracy. But what is the main mission of the UN peacekeeper in the, that country? When the president doesn't want to organize the election, but he wants to remain in power for good. So you can just give me the answer. Thank you. Thank question. you. Thank you. Professor Adeke Adebayo. Thank you, Adeke Adebayo from the Pan-African Institute. Thanks for very rich discussions. Gilbert has asked that we be on diplomatic. So I thought uh, I should just do that. Professor Sheng Yong, uh, you seem to suggest that Africa should place more priority on dictatorships and good governance. But I'm wondering whether a system with a one-party system with no free elections is our model. So that's my question to you. And the second question, there's been a lot of talk about elephants. <laughs> and there's, as many of you know, an old African proverb that when two elephants fight, it's the grass underneath that suffers. So U.S. and China are surely the elephants and Africa the grass. Uh, can you perhaps address that, John? <laughs> there was a hand right somewhere here. Yes. Can I have the mic, please? Um, my name is Dion Kwepile, and um, I'm a student here at UJ doing my social sciences, majoring in sociology. Um, I would like to suggest a few things before I go to my question, and that is, um, if ever we study Africa as a whole, um, the system in, in which the world is, is operating on doesn't alert Africa to grow effectively. Secondly, the way um, we can't... Um, think or, or pursue that or, or assume that Africa will grow in the same context as, as, as China and, uh, and, and uh, uh, USA grew. So I think that the system itself needs to be changed in terms of Africa, how, how Africa will be grow. And my question is, is it's like very um, simple, it's, it's, it's based on how can we change the system? How, what are the things that we can implement in order to to like give Africa a chance to grow too. Thanks. Thank you. A brilliant question. In absence of a war, how do we change the system for Africa's development? Uh, do the elephants allow that change? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, my name is Elsa Blaschowski from EWAS. Um, could you, I'm um, being blunt and being undiplomatic, could you please explain why the one China policy is so crucial? Thank you. I'm going to give my, the, um, please be very brief because you have already spoken. Um, Thank you so much again. Um, I know when a, um, an African child speaks to the elders, the elders are very quick to tell him there are visitors. Stop talking too much. No, no, no. You know, no, um, not at all. Uh, especially this goes to those who understand the, the, the education of an African child. When an African child, and this is why Africa is at the back foot, African elders think that they must not invest for their children. And it happens that we suffer as children in the future. Uh, we suffer in the future because it happens at the end of the day that they go and we are left behind. In the same catch 72 situation, and we want to tell our children in the future that we must not do this, we must not do that. Why can't we allow our African children to explore, to make mistakes, so that they can make the better of themselves? So the ground which Prof was speaking about. Thank you to uh, David, to our brothers. It, so as I was saying... It's a sign, a, African sign, that yeah. you should stop. That, 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 that I must continue because now thunders are coming down. Anyway, my point, my point is this. My point is this. Prof, I hear you. We spoke about 5,000 years and 250 years of people who are, in, who are already established themselves. And we're coming with a so-called democracy of how many years, ma'am? Okay, uh, of, tw of 21. My point is that in the 5,000... 221 
and we're allowing these two giants to come to us, are we going to breathe in anything in those two? Thank you. Thank you. May I allow the panelists to conclude? Um, uh, pick and choose, but please try to answer all questions. And I'll start with Gilbert. There was actually a question that I didn't answer, which was on human rights uh, from Tombi, which um, I thought it was already covered in my, my, my colleague's presentation where he says, uh, China now recognizes that human rights and governance are critical in engaging with African countries. Uh, and I, I think this is the first time I've heard, and um, I'm glad that that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the position now. So that we are making progress on that, on that, on that front. Because earlier on, you remember the discussion was, uh, China is going to, to interrupt the governance agenda that uh, the West put on board. Uh, so I think if now we are beginning to speak that same language of human rights and, uh, and the governance, uh, anti-corruption, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a big improvement. There is a question that was raised about Africa being rich. Uh, I mean, we say it so many times that we begin to believe it. Uh, there, is, there is Angolan oil, there is Nigerian oil, there is South African diamonds. Uh, but there is, I, I never get a sense of when you say Africa is rich, how that is actually translated into real. Uh, so it's, it's a vision 